Greetings and thank you for being here with us today as we uh, learn more about what God has to say to us in order to live our lives on this side of the earth. Before I begin, would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for this evening. We thank you for whatever time people are watching this Bible study. God, it's because of you that we are able to continue to learn of you through the means of technology. So God, for that, we say thank you. We thank you for this opportunity of life because it's a gift that you've given us at this present moment. And again, God, we thank you and pray that we will open our hearts and minds to the words that have been prepared today. And that again, that we will be able to use them for the upbuilding of your kingdom right here on earth. Thank you. Our emphasis for the year is kingdom citizens preparing mind, body, and spirit for post-pandemic living. And so, of course, you know, we are still uh, hanging on to that word post-pandemic, but I would like to say that we are in an endemic. Um, this situation with COVID, COVID will probably never go away, sort of like the flu. And um, so we're, we're functioning in an endemic. Our May emphasis, we're in a new month. Can you believe that? It is already May, and what a special month it would be. Kingdom citizens learning how to walk by faith, and we're going to take a journey with Abraham. Our thought, the dictionary defines faith as complete trust or confidence in something or someone. Our study of the life of Abram and eventually Abraham shows us what it means to walk by faith. To be a person of faith carries a lot of weight and a lifetime of trust. And so sometimes we use that word faith loosely, but uh, it really is a strong word and something that we have to embrace in order to uh, move through this life here on earth. We have a few words for us to consider. The word trust, and as I read these words to you, um, think of how these words resonate with you. Trust, you know, trust is, I think that's a heavy word as well, um, because we want to trust people and sometimes we lose trust in people. We want to trust things. We even trust the seat that we sit down in, not thinking that it may give away. Another word is encourage. Think of the people that you have encouraged or uh, people that have encouraged you. And again, the word faith and promise. And I like this word promise, particularly when it relates to um, our Father in heaven, because he's the only one that truly keeps his promises. All right, and um, he gives us lots of promises in the Bible. However, we have to remember them in order to uh, not go through any major challenges. All right, and so we'll talk more about that later. This lesson is entitled, Misguided Encouragement. Misguided Encouragement. So there are a few questions for us to think about. And again, this lesson is one of those lessons that I wish we had a group here to discuss it because it really could cause for some good collaboration. But nevertheless, you are here. How do you trust most to get, who do you trust most to give you advice? Who do you trust most to give you advice? And I probably would think that most people would say that they would trust their parents to give them advice. Um, they may have a very close friend that they trust to give them advice. But the question is, why do you trust these particular people to give you advice? Mm, chances are more than likely they will give you some sound advice um, and that they would make sure that the information that they're giving you is something that they will use for themselves. The next question is, what are you trusting God for most during this year? What are you trusting God for most during this year? Do you, are you trusting him? Uh, to help you to have more faith or to, um, are you trusting him that you would put yourself in situations where you can grow your faith? And the last 
question, or yeah, last question. Um, and this is a conversation that you can have perhaps with the people that you're with right now or people on your job. Can you recall a time when you took on, when you took or act on the unwise advice or counsel of someone and later regretted doing so? And the next sub question to that is, why did you take the advice? And, and so this world that we're living in, you can, I'll just take school setting for what I know because that's the area I function in the most. You know, oftentimes when students get in trouble, they will say, somebody told me to do this. I brought this weapon to school because somebody told me to do it. Now, that somebody, even though the children's parents probably told them, don't, don't listen to your friends when they're telling you to do things wrong, the children still take that advice from that friend. And then what happens? That friend is left behind at school. The person that took the advice is going up for an expulsion hearing. So we have to be careful, um, not even just as little people, but as individuals that um, are grown, okay? So we're gonna go through our lesson and it is from the book of Genesis, Genesis 16, one through six. So make note of that. I encourage you to read it in different versions. It is quite an interesting story. It definitely relates to our life here on earth. And, uh, and that's why I say we could have some good discussion about it. So the heart of the lesson is don't become weary. Wait patiently on the Lord and, av and avoid disaster. So just to give you a backdrop, God promised Abram that from a son, which would come from his own body, he would become a great nation and his descendants would be many. Abram, he believed God's promises and it was credited to him as righteousness. However, we will see in our focus scripture, which is Genesis 16, one through six, that after 10 years of waiting, 10 years of waiting, God's promise of descendants to Abram still had not come. Therefore, Abram's wife, Sarah, came up with a scheme that she perhaps thought would give God a hand in the deliverance of his promise. So since when God needed help from us in the promises that he's promised us, he, he does not need any help from us, okay? Um, if he said he's going to do it, He's going to do it. The problem is, or the challenge is, we can't wait. We don't want to wait. And I could imagine in a situation like this, 10 years is a long time. All right? So Sarah's husband, Abram, agreed to participate in this scheme without first seeking divine counsel. Now, there's a difference between counsel and divine counsel and divine counsel comes from God. A careful study of Genesis 16, one through six, it will help us to see the character strengths as well as the character weaknesses and flaws of Abram, Sarah, and Hagar, which should help us to see and correct our own character flaws. All right, and so as I mentioned before, this story is definitely a story that goes on in our current days and times. So as we travel through this lesson today, we see a few things that will or should make us reflect on our lives. In verses one through six, we will see Abram's lack of faith and Hagar's flight. In verses one through two, we will see how listening to the wrong voice can cause problems. In this case, Abraham listens to his wife, Sarah. And I'm not saying husbands shouldn't listen to wives, but I'm saying they need to have a keen ear to listening. In verses three through four, things don't turn out like they thought. And then in verses five through six, they begin to make matters worse, compounding a bad decision. So let's look at the first thing. Kingdom citizens should acknowledge their mistakes 
and take responsibility for their own actions. So pains from anxiety, weariness from hope, deferred and prayers not yet answered will weaken our faith and God's ability to keep his promise and lead us to make incorrect decisions. Despite the fact that we know scriptures about faith, we know we only need faith the size of a mustard seed, but yet we still become weary. So it is with the characters in today's lesson. We start with Sarah. She encourages Abram, and he agreed to take part in her plan to have a child with her Egyptian slave, Hagar. She tells, she says, go sleep with my slave. Now this is Sarah talking to her husband to go sleep with Hagar. Sarah took Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. Here we go, listening to the wrong voice. Remember some other folks who listened to the wrong voice? You remember Adam listened to Eve? Aaron listened to people? Israel listened to spies? Solomon listened to his wives? Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had no children, and she wanted to have a child. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. And this, this statement indicates that Sarah believed in God's sovereignty over the womb, then acted against it. And we are guilty of being impatient, but in Sarah's pains, rather than turn to God for wisdom, and renew faith and strength to wait for God's promises of descendants, Sarah took things into her own hands. She started being the decision maker for the situation. She developed an alternate plan to God's plan. And can I tell you that there's no better plan than God's plan? If we try to do things differently, we will pay dearly. So Sarah's plan, it backfired. It backfired on her. She blamed everyone except herself. First, she blamed God by saying, the Lord has kept me from having children. And I can imagine she is very upset. Next, she blamed Abram when she said, you, and I think probably she pointed her finger too, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. May the Lord judge between you and me. Here she makes matters worse. In other words, she was implying that even God knew that it was Abram's fault. If we do not admit our part in our faults and failures, then there will be little chance and opportunity for self-improvement. Oftentimes, we can't admit our faults because of pride. Do you know why admitting our faults is difficult? It's because we lack self-awareness. We can't see that person in the mirror. For some admitting they have made a mistake is too threatening to their sense of self. So what people end up doing is overcompensating by denying fault and refusing ownership of their mistake. And when people have stubborn egos, it oftentimes impacts their world and not necessarily in a positive way. The next point, kingdom citizens know that they should never try to delegate their leadership responsibilities to someone else. Then Sarah said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. Although Sarah encouraged Abram to take part in her scheme, much of the problems which occurred as a result justifi justifiably rested on Abram for several reasons. First of all, as a spiritual leader of his home, as a head of household, Abram should have known Sarah well enough and realized that his wife was speaking out of an emotional state of weariness and pains. When women can't have children, for some, it leads to depression. And I can imagine they started having relationship problems. He should have known that she was sad and was filled with doubt. After all, they were in their 80s, so surely he should have known her inside and out. So when she was doing her carrying on, having a pity party, he should have tried to encourage her faith or say something like, I don't want to sleep with this servant girl. You're my wife. Let's not disobey God. But no, 
What happened? Abram slept with Hagar. Abram was responsible for his sin of heeding the unwise, unbelief-based advice of his wife. Here's where things don't turn out like we thought. It was Abram who, who abdicated his authority and responsibilities. Sarah's character honored and showed great respect for her husband as head of the household. She made no decisions without Abram's approval, participation, and consent. She shared her feelings of being in pain with him. Her plan for them to have a child, she even told him about Hagar's disrespectful behaviors towards her and how she told him how to handle Hagar. Abram neglected his responsibility as a man of God and as the leader of his household, as if he didn't want to be bothered with the problem. And in this case, this was not a stick your head in the sand situation and act like it's going to go away if it's not addressed properly. It says, your slave is your hands, Abram said. Do with her what you think best. Kingdom citizens, kingdom citizen men, should never become too busy or so preoccupied that they don't take the opportunity or the appropriate time to handle ha family and household problems or to recognize and support the mental and emotional well-being of their families. And we all know over the pandemic years and, not, and, not the, and now the endemic times, we are still dealing with family situations that need attention. Some situations require help from doctors, psychologists, therapists. And as a people, we need to embrace, embrace that help that God has provided for us. Our final point, kingdom citizens know that they should practice humility even when blessed. Although Hagar had no say in the situation between Abram and Sarah, she did have a say about how she act. Therefore, she also bears blame for many of the problems that she encountered. When Hagar realized she was pregnant, she couldn't resist displaying an inappropriate haughtiness, thinking her pregnancy somehow showed her to be better than Sarah. When she became too high, she had to be brought down before she learned her place. And many of us have to go through some of the same steps before we can become humble. It was Sarah who caused Hagar to be elevated to a wife's position. And it was Sarah who, with Abram's approval, deflated Hagar's bubbles of pride by dealing harshly with her. All Hagar could do was to run from Abram's house and Sarah's presence. So we have to be mindful that um, we can't get the big head in basic terms, all right? Um, we can't show both things. The two great lessons that we can learn from the actions of Hagar, one is never become puffed up and haughty because you have been blessed. And so Hagar was in a situation where, okay, so she could bear children. And I would trust to say today, even sometimes, Perhaps people that are unable to have children may feel this way, even when they just see people walking that are pregnant, you know. Um, and so this takes a toll on a woman, my, a woman's mind, body, and her soul, particularly if they want to bear children. And we also need to remember that, um, as it's been said, if man elevates you, man surely can bring you down. And we see that often in these days and times. I hope this lesson was fruitful to you, bring some remembrance, and um, have some discussion about it with a few friends or family members so you can really get into the aspect of uh, the man being the head of the household, um, when he should or shouldn't listen to the advice of his wife, um, also them taking care of their home and addressing situations. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the word that you've given us. We pray that we'll be able to apply it to our lives to help us or to help others. And God, we pray that we will return back to this sacred place to share more of you. Amen. Thank you.